we are getting closer and closer to that dreaded time when we're going to actually go back out in public and be surrounded by real normal human beings, sometimes without masks. I, Carrie, am flipped out by this. I have, uh, I'm going to pay some therapist some good money because I acquired brand new agoraphobia during the, during the uh, thing. And I hate my fellow humans. I hate them. I, every time I see a picture of a whole bunch of people gather around hugging on Instagram, I'm like, you're now not my friends. You're now not my friend. So we got to fix this. I need a cure. Now, what if a cure could come in a box or a crate? Mm. What if a, a crate? A crate. I feel uh, like that would be handy. A cure crate would be good. But just in case I need a little more than just what's in the cure crate, which we're going to talk about today, I also have our favorite resident super shrink, Dr. Bob Brooks. Uh, we're going to have super a shrink. Good. Super shrink. Is that, is that what he puts on his LinkedIn? I wish he did. He hasn't. So the, the thing is, this is one of those rare instances in human history where like we're all having the same experience at the same time. And obviously having experienced the pandemic, we've all experienced lockdown to different degrees. And now we need to like find a way back out of it. And I think that's going to be challenging. I said hi to your mom. Oh, you really? said hi to everybody? I don't know. I'm just touching uh -huh. the buttons. <laughs> Stop it. We Why do you hire people to touch buttons if you're going to do it your own self? I feel like we should ask Dr. Bob about that. Like, what's that disorder called? <laughs> hi, everyone. Tim Kitzer from NBA Jam and NFL Blitz welcoming you to The Backpack Show. Your hosts, Chris Brogan, Kerry Gargone, Boom Shakalaka. Backpack Show. Should I have told Dr. Brooks that when he called me irreverent as a speaker, it was a huge compliment? Like, I'm just like, yes! No. I want to, I want to get back to speaking, but I haven't spoken in a while. You speak all the time. Like well, daily. Well, on, on screens. <laughs> That's screen. how everybody is speaking right now. You mean like in person. Someone's in a conference room somewhere you mean by themselves. get in a giant tin tube 25,000 feet above the ground with a bunch of people you don't know breathing air near you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going to have such a horrible time coming back to the real world. Yes. We, what are we going to do about this? It is know. nuts. You need to ask Dr. Bob. It is nuts. Um, and then I, we're going to talk to two very fine entrepreneurs about the Cure Crate. Well, so don't go anywhere after we after we get your handled, like your reintegration handled. Then we'll talk to serial entrepreneur and brand strategist Sean Wynn and healthcare consultant Alexandra McConnery about Cure Crate, the one of a kind CBD subscription service. That's what we're going to do. Hey, look, I have only like three ads StreamYard, make your own <laughs> damn show. See, we're going to miss our StreamYard. Wow. Castos, make your own podcast or uh, dot online if you want your own dot online domain think about yes. it curecrate dot online seabrogan.me slash online use the code chris in all caps to get that and thing for one buck yeah it's crazy cheap crazy cheap all right i'm garvin dr brooks yes dr brooks <laughs> save me um i've acquired a little <laughs> bit of agoraphobia and i don't like my fellow man anymore uh -huh. what are we gonna do <laughs> I, I'm laughing still about uh, the word irreverent. irreverent. I did it in the most complimentary way, Chris. I took it. <laughs> you know, it's it's really interesting because some people might say, finally, we're able to be free and go out and see people again. And so some people even listening might say, well, why is there that much of an adjustment? But there is. And what it reminded me of was the adjustment when the pandemic hit, because I remember when it hit and being in the house for like two weeks and I had to get something at the local CVS less than a mile down the road. And this is almost the opposite of what we're going to talk about. When I got in the car to drive to the CVS, I felt this is how Christopher Columbus's uh, mother must have felt when he was going off to the new world. Here was only a mile away, but the adjustment was very great. Well, we've been very used uh, to now uh, this being on screens. And one of the things I've said is we're all going to have to adjust differently. Certainly, there is the issue that you brought up. I don't want to go to any place, even though I've been fully vaccinated, if people still are not wearing masks, uh, you know, or, or not respecting social distancing. But assume that takes place. I've always felt as a therapist that you don't try to change everything overnight. I hope this doesn't sound overly simplistic. So my feeling is, uh, Chris, in terms of the question uh, that you raised and that I was invited on the show with you and Kerry, it, is we are gonna wanna get out 
We really do. Uh, do. I, I think there's just so long one could stay in their home and uh, wear their pajama bottoms. Uh, and we do have to get out. Some people I, wear pajama bottoms? Yeah. Well, my blue jeans, thank heavens I had three pairs before the pandemic started. Uh, they've uh, pretty well, well worn out. But I, I really think we have to look at what are we comfortable doing and how do we do it in, in almost piecemeal. I always say to people, your eventual goal is to get out there again. But how are you going to do it in a way you feel comfortable? Some people just it's walking a half mile outside. Uh, others, you know, you still can wave to certain people. Some people have said to me, even if you're fully vaccinated, uh, is it okay to wear a mask as if they need my permission? I said, do what you feel comfortable doing. And it's almost like a, one step at a time. Some people listening might say, you know, it's foolish. I'm just going to get out there. And there are some people like that. But I think we have to realize that it's now been more than a year that we've now almost adapted, I'll say, to a certain lifestyle. And what I've been telling people is think about what your eventual goal may be and think about those steps that you would feel comfortable taking. And you don't need a PhD in psychology to to suggest that, but I, I feel each step makes us feel more comfortable to take the next step, to take the next step. I'm not ready to go into a restaurant yet, even if there's social distancing. I am ready to sit outside on a patio at a restaurant. So it may seem simple, but I also say to people, don't worry if it, some people may adjust more easily, some may not. Some people may find it much more difficult to go to their office. And so there too, one has to look at what are the small steps that you can take uh, to do this. It's the same, I get questions from parents, same about kids, kids going back to school. You know, we, we do it in a way where they're gonna feel as comfortable as possible. So that's in a general way, uh, I, I look at that. I always feel one small step that is successful leads to another step, leads to another uh, uh, step. But I, I know at this point, I'm gonna take it slow, but I hope the point is reached. <clears throat> well, and then, then I'll wait for another question. I know I'm running on here. <clears throat> I don't have any in-person talks scheduled, I think till the beginning of November and it's in New Hampshire. So I can drive there. I don't have to be on a flight. And even there, it's open to how the situation is, whether it will be turned into a webinar. And that's what I feel comfortable with. Carol says any change, even a change for the better, is always accompanied by drawbacks and discomforts. Sorry to make you like Mike Wazowski there with your, it's a long one. <laughs> no, no, could I, I'd like to respond. Uh, one of the things I say to people, there was a wonderful book uh, called Rethinking Positive Thinking. And in that book, it basically said, Gabrielle Utengen is the author, she's a psychologist. Whenever you're gonna make changes, think about what the discomfort is, but she used the word, she said, always think about what the obstacles may be, but that just think about the obstacles may make you feel more anxious, but then think about ways you're gonna cope with these obstacles. So what she felt and the research she did is, if you just think of your goals without thinking of the obstacles, it's gonna be a problem. If all you think about are the obstacles, you're gonna be more depressed. But what she found, people were most successful when they said, okay, here are my goals, these are my possible obstacles, and maybe I'm gonna feel anxious or, I'm going to feel worried or depressed. And then if that occurs, how am I going to handle the obstacles? It, it, again, it may seem simple enough, but thinking about obstacles, but also how you're going to cope develops what I call in my resilience books, personal control. People are less worried and anxious if they focus on what they have control over. And I've been doing this for years, but now with patients or webinars I give, I'm much more specific about what are the obstacles you're going to face. So I could ask our good friend Chris there, what obstacles does he think he's going to face when he goes out there? How is he going to cope? What is he going to feel comfortable coping with? And I will tell you, these techniques work with, for anyone listening who's a parent, work with, for young kids all the way through our senior years, in, you know, in that regard. So Chris just turned 51. So do you think it will? Now that I'm in my senior years, Dr. Brooks, that's going to be very helpful. Thank you. Chris, um, you're always going to be youthful. You have that great smile and your irreverence, uh, which I did mean in the most complimentary. I take it in the best way. 
No, I still remember, and then we'll get back to the topic, the first time I heard you, and I really had not known as much about your work, except my son, Rich, just loved uh, your work, and uh, just saying, this guy is so psychologically oriented and just so relaxed uh, there, and in, in just communicating some very important psychological concepts. Welcome to the Backpack Show, where we talk about why Chris Brogan is wonderful here on his own show, and I'm just here to validate it. He is, in fact, wonderful. Harry, that is, that is that is great. That <laughs> is, I don't even know. This is so therapeutic for Chris, really. I feel good. <laughs> I feel good. My biggest I, problem is how people have not changed their behavior, by the way. Like, seeing people who now are, they're, they're the same people that have been running around without masks, packing bars in Nashville, doing, eating, like, dining in, doing all the same stuff, and then they're like, I'm signing up at Kroger for a shot, so y'all have to wait. <laughs> like, what? Screw you. <laughs> you haven't done anything. So. It's um, there's, yeah. a com- there's a comedian down in Tennessee, Nate Bargatze, and he says he's got basically two friends. One set of friends who are in the house wearing their mask while they're having dinner by themselves in the house. And there's no <laughs> one else in the house except for a hamster, but he might have COVID. Uh, and then on the other scope, there's a whole set of friends that they don't even think there is such a thing. Or, or it's, it looks almost like from, you know, observing from the outside that someone's paying them to see if they can go get it because they're just <laughs> rushing around as fast as they can to as many maskless environments as they can. So I, I feel like, you know, when you were saying about sort of what, you know, thinking about the personal handling, you're right about the outside patio. I can eat at an outside uh, thing at a restaurant now, especially if they put those plexiglass screens in between me and them. But when I look inside, now I know what germaphobes felt like. Like mm-hmm. I, I get what they're dealing with because when I look into the darkness of the restaurant to say, can I sit out here? I I would throw up, I think, if I stepped over the transom at present. But to your point, you know, right now that's what I can do. And it, of course, at some point I'll be get normal and back to stepping into, well, I won't be normal, but I'll be able to step back into restaurants. Yeah. I've been in, the, in terms of your comments, I, I mean, I've, I've been very conservative. I've thought of, and I'm usually very optimistic, the worst case scenarios, if you will. And I say, Given COVID, I'm going to think about the worst case scenarios. So I have to do what I'm comfortable with because it's been so unpredictable. I mean, when I was using the treadmill this morning, the rise in cases. So I don't think we should relax, even though I know there's a whole group of people who are. One one of the reports said some of the increase in the uh, Midwestern states was based on some of what went on during spring break even. So I think we have to be careful. So in this case, I'm being overly cautious, but that's my comfort level. But I'm also starting to go out more. We had close friends who have also been very careful and vaccinated actually come to our house. You know, it's almost like we, the best way I could say it, I'm smiling to say it, is like we were little kids. <laughs> you know, like, oh my God, we're together again. We have a play but date. This, but this was a first step. Friends we knew had been very cautious, friends who were also fully vaccinated. And we all felt comfortable, uh, you know, together in this regard. And But I think if anyone feels anxious, they shouldn't feel bad about it. They, this is very natural. They're going to be very different feelings, even if you're excited about starting to do things pre-pandemic, if I'll say. There's still, we, we've had a certain lifestyle for over a year that has been very protective and we've used different ways of coping. And then as we change this, we still have to look at what we were most comfortable with. Now, if we would, if, if things were really much better under control a year from now and Chris was to say, I can't get out of my room, then th- there is more of an issue. Uh, so I don't want to in any way minimize uh, any of this. But I personally think, and I my last website column was, what does the future hold? I personally think based on uh, other things that have occurred in, in different uh, disasters, if you will, man-made or otherwise, that people slowly do get back to whatever it is. What, and I, I, you know, I almost dislike the word new normal because I don't even know what normal is. But I think that we, I, I, I think that one of the things we find is people are much more resilient than we realize, most people. And that's what got me inter- inter- interested in the topic to begin with. Within every person, I think there are, is the ability, within reason, to be more resilient and to cope more effectively. Amanda said the key oh is to communicate your COVID expectations with family and friends. Mm-hmm. And Chris's mom loves me. 
<laughs> oh, <laughs> your mother always attend. Was that your mom? Okay. Yeah, my mom and dad are here uh, every episode. <laughs> I always, you have a wonderful son. I always, because I, I, every time I've been on, they, they're very re religious uh, viewers. Uh, yeah, so I think it will take time. The other thing I really want to stress, who's anyone who's listening who may have kids at home, there was a wonderful article looking at some uh, research, I think, and I, I quoted it in this article, my last website article, uh, that basically said how well kids navigate coming out of the COVID, COVID pandemic will be based on how well the parents navigate so the situation. So we really have to look at ourselves as, as well. But, you know, I, tend, I think having written about resilience for over 30 years, I do feel that while there are different levels of how quickly we can be resilient and cope, that that with support, most of us can be um, very resilient. That adds another whole layer of pressure. Now I got to worry about what my kids are taking away from my response to this whole situation. Well, not to put pressure, uh, it's but it's I it's it's a very important concept. You know, it's like when you go on a plane, put the, your oxygen. I haven't been on a plane, so I don't know if they're still saying this. Put your oxygen mask on yourself first. Uh, before anyone else, because you have to protect yourself so you can protect your kids. They say that, but they also say you got to take your other mask off first so you can actually get the oxygen. <laughs> they have to tell people that. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think why I really wanted to discuss this and when you invited me on is that I think in any transition, and one of the your viewers said this, there's going to be some anxiety as we make changes, some, uh, some anxiety in terms of the next step. But I really feel if we carefully look at what we're comfortable with, if we think small steps leading to the bigger goal, if we consider the obstacles that may come up and how we're going to handle it, in my experience, those are the things that help us to then go through these different transitions. And this, of course, is unprecedented trans, you know, transition we're going through right now. Well, I'm optimistic. I mean, now that we're back to fairly common and, and frequent mass shootings, I feel like we're... <laughs> We're right around the corner. Like it's there. I went to well, look at one this morning and I was, I thought I was looking at the Texas one, but I was wrong. I was looking at the new one uh, from Wisconsin. Didn't Dave Chappelle make a joke about that? Last even? night. Like during COVID, when he was performing during COVID, he was like, hey man, thank God for COVID. Finally stop those mass shootings. All those crazy white people with guns now well, stay in their oh, house. Very honestly, when you just brought that up, Chris, I'm more anxious about the, that than actually slowly coming out and changing our style right. uh, in terms of COVID. It is amazing to me. I don't remember a time that there have been so many mass shootings in such a brief period of time. Uh, and as mass shootings are taking place in just ordinary places uh, that can be. So if anything, I, I feel every time I read this, I say, I can't believe this. Another one. And you know what? I had the same reaction when I got online this morning. I said, is this the mass shooting I heard about yesterday or is this a, a new one going on? Right. Because one of the reasons is uh, both of you know, I talk, as I mentioned before, this notion of personal control, what you have control over. Right. And I I always say we are the authors of our own lives. And I'll tell you why I'm bringing this up right now. And that doesn't mean we we totally write the script for our lives, but I, I've often said we have we have more control over our attitude and response to things than we realize. So I think that we could slowly, it may be a slow process, change having been in hibernation or whatever we want to call it for a year, that we have control of. What we have almost no control over are these mass shootings or things that go on like that. They make me more anxious. So I could say, you know what? The first time I go out of state, I may be a little anxious, but I could, t you know, already I've taken a little trip to Massachusetts, but I have no control over the gu guns. So also, unless we sign petitions, whatever, but I hate to say this as optimistic as I am, I don't know how, how much good uh, that will do, but I think we still should sign them. But I, I think that uh, why I focus on personal control is with what we're going to go through in the next few months related to the pan pandemic, I do think we, we are the authors of our own lives. I do think we could find ways, small steps, uh, then I do think we have more control over our, our attitude and response to things than we may realize. 
And one of my favorite books, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, a psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor, he said, even in the concentration camps, and I know this may seem overly dramatic, people could choose to be dignified. He talks about some people who gave away, this was an actual quote, their last morsel of food to someone who was even more hungry than they were. They proved the Nazis could take anything away from you, but the last of the human freedoms to choose your attitude and response in any given set of circumstances. I love so what I, a weapon uh, Victor Frankl said a smile could be in those moments. You know, yes. The fact that he, you know, he stood up to the Nazis with just a pleasant good morning, you know, mm. if he, when, he, when he felt like that was going to mess him up even more. It's, it's an incredible book. It's a book worth everybody reading as yeah, well as I, your books. I've read it now six or seven times. And most books I read once say I should read it again, but then I see the 50 books I haven't read. But it, that book captures even, could be very helpful for people today to think about Look, he could say even in a concentration camp in hell, you could right. still use your you know attitude in uh, regard to different situations, uh, and that's that's my whole philosophy about resilience. I write a lot about personal control. What do you have control over, and take steps that you feel comfortable with, and so you have to push yourself sometimes in that regard. I know I'm going to feel anxious the first time I go into a restaurant. I'm going to I'm going to make sure it's safe, but I know I'm going to feel, you know, I'm going to say, what is this kind of place, you know, here? It's one thing to be in a patio, but inside uh, the restaurant. But I, I just say I'll feel anxious. And then once I'm sitting seated, if I feel very comfortable there, I'm going to feel less anxious. Dr. Brooks, you make me feel less anxious. So thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it immensely. If you could stick around, we'll have our little mm -hmm. group at the end. So group session. Thank you so much. Thanks I'll for having you. me, Chris. Thank and you Karen. for being Don't here. Don't go anywhere, Boop. Dr. Bob. All right. Cure Create it is. So in case uh, none of that worked enough, or in case you have other therapeutic needs, here comes some Cure Create. <laughs> Hello to the two of you. Welcome to the gang. <gasps> we have a promo code, too. You're live. Good to see you. I so I'm making a banner right now. Hello. Oh, well, pardon me. So Sean and <laughs> Alexandra, uh, we have a lot to learn about the lands of Cure Crate. You're going to have to make us smarter and educate us and, and give us a sense of what's going on with this. And then we'll talk all about the guts of the business, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, you wanna, Cure Crate is a, you know, we are a personalized premium CBD subscription box. Um, so users, as you can see on our website, uh, you take a quiz and we are then, uh, you know, on the back end sort of match your quiz results to the best, you know, tested and, you know, quality tested and top rated CBD products. And it ships to your door uh, every month. And also sort of a, you know, a, a special thing about us is we implement a feedback quiz where you're you know allowed to let us know what you loved about your box. Uh, anything you maybe didn't love about your box, and then your subscription grows with you as you, uh, you know, as you continue to go along on the on the subscription journey. So, uh, yeah, we've been around for uh, about a year, just over just over a year, um, and yeah, we are uh, really really excited about the CBD space and sort of all of the, uh, you know, all of the the possibilities of of what CBD can do, and you know, we've had a lot of great responses so far. So let's just start. about a year. What was happening a year ago? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, let's start with timing. Uh, you were like, you know, the world just blew up. I guess I'll launch yeah. a company. Absolutely. Well, actually, <laughs> the I think the, the weekend before like the lockdowns took place, it was sort of getting a little a little real. And I think I text Alexandra when I was coming back from the office and I was like, you think we should wait? And she was just like, no, no, not at all. And Are you kidding? People need this more than ever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's the perfect time. And, and you know, really, um, we were launching with more so a proof of concept at the time as well. Um, ultimately, you know, we're applying data science, algorithm, you know, those big fancy words to how we're matching products to people and then incorporating feedback and then improving upon products too, right? Um, but we launched with just uh, the, a more simple version and really started focusing on the customer experience and what they were getting. Um, and then we've been building it as, I mean, the pandemic was a, a great time for e-commerce. Like, if you're a stressed out mom at home or just a stressed out person at home, receiving a, you know, a pretty colorful box at your front door with a surprise of goodies that are designed to help 
ease your back pain from sitting on the couch all day and, <laughs> you know, help your anxiety. Also some like yummy, just treats, edibles that makes the pandemic a lot easier and better and more fun. Um, so it was a good time, I think, really to, you know, start offering it. And we even thought about one point about going back, you know, launching proof of concept, going back to the drawing board, refining our back end, but people were, messaging us like you're helping me so so much and mm -hmm. so we we didn't want to take that away obviously so we've just yeah. been building as we go yeah how'd you decide what goes in like it like in your initial stuff like how did you plan the first cure crates the first so the first cure crates actually were you know a a product of i think just you know very convenient in great circumstances i was at the time uh you know consulting for a cbd drop shipping company which is you know essentially you know the and sort of trying to be like the amazon of cbd um and you know they they have not found much success uh you know since but i think it did allow us the opportunity to have access to a lot of product initially at you know a really incredible incredible rate um and well, then, you were he was working for the cannabis founded the yeah. cannabis strategy organization at one of the really big talent agencies in los angeles and yeah. so we were seeing all these new products get launched all the time, you know, in CBD and the cannabis space. Um, and so we were getting to know these, you know, really great products overall, but we were realizing that what well, started with our moms personally, our moms are very different people, um, but both of them were not understanding what CBD was. We got a text that they had gotten CBD from the gas station and we were like, stop throw it away <laughs> no, you know no. and and so code we, red yeah right <laughs> and so we were using our personal knowledge at the time of obviously our mom's needs where their education was at one of our moms mine is very cannabis friendly um <laughs> versus very. his um his mom you know has never consumed has no idea and so their education levels um, in regards to cannabis were very different. And they also just had different needs, pain versus anxiety versus sleep. And so we were taking all of these great products that we were going to release parties for, seeing, trying ourselves and picking the ones that we thought would be best for them. And so we started applying that basically then to customers. And then more and more now, it's very much data driven based off what you give us in the quiz and then what you like, because when you like a product, it might be because um, you really like the flavor of it or the texture of it or the effect of it. And those are all different things that would determine what you like about the next product. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily just one thing. Yeah. In the process of doing all this, there's, uh, you know, first off, there's so much education to be had. People don't know about the endocannabinoid system. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't understand. I mean, feels like everyone should by now. Yeah. understand the difference between CBD and THC, but they sure don't. They don't. Um, and it seems like there's, there's just a massive amount of education. Now, uh, as you said, Sean, you were kind of working in this space, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of easier things you could have drop shipped. You know, yeah. you, you could have just done some massage kits or something or some, Absolutely. you know, home spas or something. Why this? Um, yeah, I think, you know, I, I see the, the potential of CBD. I myself have, uh, you know, I, I no longer smoke THC. You know, I'm a, of a long life, like not lifelong, but a very long cannabis user. And, you know, I myself was finding that THC was sort of, you know, making my anxiety worse in a lot of instances. And a lot of people do report that. Uh, so I, you know, gravitated towards CBD and I found, you know, sort of the, the first couple of times that I had the, the experience with, you know, cannabis and had that calming feeling uh, you know, I found it to return and I, I found CBD to just be really, really helpful. And, you know, sort of like being in the industry, you know, starting the, you know, the WME Green, which is the cannabis strategy group at William Morris Endeavor, you know, really getting to see sort of all of the potential of the, you know, of the plant and like all of the amazing things that, you know, sort of the medical implications of it. I felt that that was really the you know, the, the, a huge white space and there's just not, you know, and like you said, on the education front, right? Like that is 
a very big value proposition for us is we educate our consumers, uh, not only on our, you know, like there's information on our website, on our Instagram channel, we're constantly, you know, educating consumers. And there's a welcome book inside of the first crate that not only breaks down what you can expect, but also gives you a, a tracking journal in the back to, you know, sort of like mark down your own like experience with it. So you can have an idea like, okay, these milligrams on this day made me feel like this. And then, you know, because effects do build over time. So I, you know, I think CBD was the natural choice for us because, you know, we wanted to do something in the cannabis industry, uh, you know, definitely saw the potential there. Um, and yes, yeah, CBD was a, is a, was a, was a great first stop. And, uh, you know, like, I think just sort of like that on top of the, you know, sort of changing the way that cannabis looks, right? Like there's a lot of founders in this space, but not many that look like us, right? So, you know, just, you know, doing our part to, you know, make it a, a little bit more of an equitable industry. So Sean and Alexandra, how did each of you know that the other would be a great business partner? Yeah. <laughs> well, the <laughs> difference between having like a fun idea that you both agree is yeah. cool and working totally. well together. Totally. So we've been partners in life for five years now. Yeah. Um, and I think we always really respected each other's um, hustle and drive and, and how the other person thinks and their respective businesses. Sean obviously was working in entertainment. Um, I was working in healthcare um, on the business side of things as a consultant um, for medical centers, pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. And so as the ideas started coming together, I was really passionate about uh, personalized medicine in general as well, which CBD is actually very, very big in the pharmaceutical um, land as well, besides the more direct to consumer space um, and patient education, empowering um, people to figure out what works for them and their health and their life and not just prescribing people things. And so, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I think he saw that passion in me and that understanding of the healthcare space and how you design that experience and educate people and apply data. And he obviously knew cannabis super well, knew the brands, um, knew the companies, and also had a really great marketing experience and how to um, forge partnerships with talent um, and really grow companies that way. And so yeah. I think uh, we knew each other a fit and we all, we also knew we're not afraid to challenge one another <laughs> since we're life partners, yeah. um, which I think you want in a co-founder. Um, but it could also be, bad like because in you're yeah. always talking shop right and yeah for sure. and if anything goes wrong the stakes yeah. are like way higher yeah, yeah. especially yeah. living together in a pandemic so yeah, yeah. it's uh <laughs> for sure it's been it's been quite an experience but it's been it's been great for sure she's totally right like i saw her saw her hustle i saw her ambition you know saw how successful she's been and definitely wanted to you know do something to you know do something together for sure uh, you know as we we stopped drinking at the top of 2020 and live music was going away. So, you know, those were like our, <laughs> our two, you know, our two passions were going out and drinking and, you know, going to shows. So <laughs> drinking all, was the passion. But... You're like, I picked the wrong time to give up drinking. <laughs> I, I know. So we had, uh, we had no, a lot of free time. So it really ended up making a lot of sense for sure. You mentioned really quickly that the other people who run some of these businesses don't always look like you. Um, that's been a that's been a big interest in the unfolding story of legal uh, yeah. cannabis in America. And I saw that you have a whole a bunch of work that you're you're working to help with decriminalization and supporting those causes. It's important. I watched. Um, uh, trigger warning with Killer Mike. One mm -hmm. of the things that he was going through is he, he was trying to. He did one episode where he wanted to put all his money in black-owned businesses, and he was great yeah. until it came to weed. Yep. And he was like, "Oh God, what am I going to do about this? Northern California is all white people weed." Correct. And he goes, "You know, maybe Mexico, but I don't have any connections there. This yeah. is. It was a little less legal when he was working on it. Mm -hmm. um, that factors into this story somehow. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and what it what it means to you know be a, a black-owned business in this space and all that? Of course, yeah. So I think you know the that you know the sort of the the impetus for that was you know, like I said, you know, working in the, on the entertainment side of cannabis, uh, you know, I was, since we were the, the first cannabis strategy group of our kind, you know, meeting with all of these multi-state operators and, you know, it was consistently, you know, mostly white men, occasionally brown men, but, you know, not, not, you know, and very little Latino population representation, almost no black representation. Um, and the sort of the understanding that, 
if you were to ask any of those people who are working in the cannabis space, you know, like 25 years ago, where did you get your cannabis? It would almost m almost 100 percent be a black person or, you know, a brown person or somebody that they worked with at a restaurant. Right. So like all of the work that, you know, black and brown people did during when it was illegal, you know, giving this plan the kudos to sort of be, you know, a multi multi billion dollar plant now. There's no acknowledgement of that, you know, like because there's people who are, you know, who are growing cannabis or selling cannabis in, in California with a criminal record now, and they can't get access to the financing to start a dispensary or, uh, you know, just really just the access um, and all of the the large expense that it takes also to, you know, in, in California, if you were to open a dispensary, you're looking at a mid six figure, you know, investment to start at a minimum, you know, so it's, uh, there are, are high barriers to entry that I think aren't really aren't really accounted for. And there weren't many companies that were really doing anything to change cannabis criminal justice. So we made it, uh, you know, definitely very clear that if we were going to do something in the cannabis space, we were going to try to, you know, do whatever efforts we could to, like I said, change cannabis criminal justice. And I met with the last prisoner project uh, while it was still at William Morris when they were first getting started. And I really, you know, vibed with what they were doing as an organization uh, because, you know, they're, they're very big in, you know, recidivism and trying to change the lives of people and getting people out of prison. Uh, so, yeah, like we at the outset, we knew that we were not going to be able to capably start our own practice in that space. So rather than do that, we just wanted to put our money towards good work. So we began immediately donating a portion of proceeds every month to Last Prisoner Project. And, you know, that's something we we still do to this day. And, uh, you know, we're also working with a great company called Mission Green that is a little bit more hands on. They just got Corvain Cooper out of prison for. Wow. Uh, yeah, he just got a, the guy who had a life sentence for for a quarter for 40 tons of, of cannabis, which, again, yeah, that's a lot of cannabis. But nobody should be in prison for the rest of their life for a plant that I can walk into a store 20 feet from my door and purchase now. Right. So, uh, you know, in those sort of organizations and then also, you know, I went to a HBCU in Jackson, Mississippi. So creating a, you know, somewhat of an employment and internship pipeline there to you know, let people who know, who don't live in legal states know that there is, you know, there's there's employment and there's sort of a future in this cannabis space. So, yeah, it's really important for us. And recidivism for those who it's too early in the day is when you <laughs> leave jail and go right back because you yes. did something again. Yes, exactly. So course. you want that rate low. Lower, of yes. course. Yes. Lower. But the more prospects people have upon leaving prison, the better the situation is, the less likely they are to reoffend and go back. Exactly. So, exactly. Yep. Well, and it's a super huge, important point that like this entire industry uh, before it was legalized was on the backs of black and brown people yep. for uh, like almost a hundred percent. You know, the money didn't go to them and money went up yeah. uh, like it has in a lot of industries. So it's now finally a chance to your point, uh, Sean, where people can have a piece of the pie possibly, you know, and be, yeah. and be part of the process instead of uh, behind the bars. Absolutely. Yeah, no, for sure. And, yeah. And there's a, you know, there's a, uh, I, you know, I will give credit, you know, there's some of the, the states that are now coming into the legalization, like legalization space, like New York specifically, uh, you know, they're reserving a, per, a percentage of those licenses to social equity applicants. Um, but I can tell you from the back end of the industry side, a lot of those social equity applicants get their backing from other multi-state operators. And then they, you know, the, the face is a black person, but all of the money goes to, you know, more, more white people. So uh, it, it just needs to, we need to get a little bit deeper. Like we're still, we're, we're now having the conversation as we have been for the past year, uh, but right. I think we just need to be asking a little bit more questions and getting a bit deeper and we can do some great work for sure. There's big stuff ahead. I'm grabbing Dr. Bob back in. Remember, go to curecrate.co and use yes. the code BACKPACK, all caps, to get your 15 bucks off your first crate. Hey, Dr. Bob. Hi. Can I just uh, uh, yes. wish? You can uh, do whatever you want, Dr. Bob. Yeah. It's your sure. third time back. I Next time you get a jacket. Alexandra and Sean, really much success. And I'm especially impressed with your social action activities, if we want to put that under one wide umbrella. Uh just based on the questions that you were asked. So uh, I hope all goes very successfully uh, for you. Thank you. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you so much. And we appreciate everything that you, we were obviously listening and uh, you know, you are speaking to us uh, very much on the, uh, the agoraphobia and getting back <laughs> into the world, so. Well, I was thinking too, um, 
I started with CBD drinks when I quit drinking alcohol. And that's one of been my biggest anxieties about going back into the real world is like being around everyone drinking again. And I'm like, I'm so grateful that I have all of these CBD and other beverages now that yeah. I can still know I'm going to have a little bit of a relaxation um, or if other ingredients, uh, you know, a little bit of a buzz, but not be stressed out about everyone else drinking well, a lot. You so. know, what you just said, Alexander, it really ties to this notion of, uh, you know, I talk a lot about coping strategies. Yeah. And the more we feel we have, well, there are some coping strategies that are not as effective, but there are some that are very effective. And so when you say that, it gets under this concept of what I call personal control, that if you didn't have this, uh, this way of co coping, if you will, in terms of the drinking, it would be more anxiety provoking. But as you said it, and you had a big smile on your face, you're glad you have this because we feel less anxious when we feel, okay, we have ways of handling uh, things. And so I, I'm pretty convinced that you'll be able to more comfortably go out there whenever that may be and other people drinking because you feel, well, I have a way of dealing with this. What makes people most anxious is, and I often have said this in my workshops, I ask people, have any of you faced a problem? And your first thought is, I don't even know where to start. And I always <laughs> raise my hands. For, you know, but I say, imagine if almost every problem you faced, you felt that way. And that's what leads people to feel hopeless, helpless, and anxious. So you found already a way, you're thinking, you know what it's doing? It's actually, you're thinking of what an obstacle may have been, but you're thinking that, but I already know how I'm gonna cope with this. And it really reinforces some of what I mentioned before. So I'm glad for that example, thank you. Absolutely, Great. absolutely. And I need to get some pants that don't have elastic on them. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't hate. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Well, maternity have, wear is comfortable. You know what? You just have to tell, oh, you yeah. just have to tell yourself when you put on your other uh, pants that they just shrunk. It had nothing to do. With it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little denial. It may not really yeah. help. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nothing to do with not going to the gym for a year. I still won't go to the gym actually because people will like they'll get in there and exercise. They'll take their masks off. Do they'll huff and puff and then they like put it back on? I'm like, thank I'm you so much. A, uh, yeah. a, a basement where I have a treadmill and I do most even going outside. Yeah, I don't want to keep taking my mask off, and, uh, you know, on as people pass by. So I'm really glad that I, I I'm fortunate I have that I could use the treadmill in the morning, uh, there. So that's one of my ways of coping. Yeah, for sure. We yeah, agree. The real pants will be a challenge. <laughs> Absolutely. You are right, Janice, for sure. Yeah, I have one yeah. question for all of you. Do you feel that uh, you're going to cheat? Are you going to lose any of your focus when you get the chance to go and be anywhere you want again? Yeah, honestly, <laughs> I'm not even just going to be completely honest. Yeah, I do believe that the past, you know, 14, 15 months at this point has really, you know, allowed for a level of focus on you know tasks that I would not have been able to, you know, really have had uh, you know the world not been shut down. Especially you know working in entertainment and live music, and you know it's a, a lot of concerts, a lot of festivals, a lot of traveling. Uh, you know, like people, you know, sort of the the you know the time that it takes to just get from. I mean, you know, Carrie, you were saying at the beginning, you know, like getting a metal tin and go across the country to sit into a room. That's that is. I don't believe it's going to come back entirely, but you know, I will get in a metal tin and go across the country to you know see a concert. So you know, I think a, a quite a like I will lose some of the focus. I'm just trying to you know figure out what things I will you know take to be the the most important. But yeah, what about you, Alan? I don't know. I I kind of plan on living like this forever a little bit. <laughs> and I used to travel for work Monday through Thursdays, but. I don't think that's coming back. I, I don't think people are going to travel for work as much. Um, and and I think in a way it allowed me to be more focused because be more prioritized about how I'm spending my time. Like, yes, I'm going to go to dinner tonight, but, you, but I'm going to make the most of the time I have then before and after versus now like late stage pandemic brain. I kind of wander. I'm like, what am I supposed to be doing again? Like around the house. So in a way, I think the um, the boundaries of having different places and different activities allow you to make the most, allow me to make the most 
of the spaces I do have. Dr. Again, Brooks, last words? I was just going to say, in terms of my professional activities, I can't travel anymore, but I was very fortunate that uh, we had the technology to allow me to at least continue to do webinars and interviews. Uh, and I think I've become a little more focused even in terms of my time and, and writing. Uh, so I don't know how much it's going to change because I don't see myself traveling to a big conference for at least another year or, or more. And most big conferences aren't taking place uh, uh, probably for that amount of time. So, you know, it's really also a time, my last words, to, uh, to really, uh, we can assess also what are some of our interests? What are some of our passions? I, I loved uh, when Alexandra talked about her passions, which, you know, came across probably to Sean uh, there in the interest. It, but it gives us time to really reassess certain things, what are really important uh, to us. So, and I, we continue to do that in that regard. And I, I'm hoping we use this also for moments of our own growth and looking at what, what are we really interested in doing. That is great and wonderful and powerful feedback. We've hit that spot in the show where it's time for Person of the Day. Oh, and here's our Person of the Day. Kaboom! There's been oh so many conversations rolling around in this thing today. It's going to be hard to pick a Person of the Day. So I'm going to go with Janice. <laughs> Because she's so right about that. Yes. Avatar too much. Too, too much. All right. We are at the part of the show that we didn't talk about backstage, but you'll get your first shot at Dr. Brooks with the third shot at it, which is what goes in your backpack? This is a question we've asked every guest from Sir Mix a lot to Sister Ann Flanagan. We ask a question about what's something either physical or metaphorical you can put into your backpack. Usually we kind of want a small Twitter sized answer, so keep that in mind. But it could be something physical. Like what, Carrie? What's a good physical thing to put in the backpack? Extra set of teeth. An extra set of teeth, naturally. And <laughs> is there something metaphorical we could throw into the backpack? What sounds good? Kindness. Kindness. Yeah. Ah, never, never gets old. Um, Deb says, finding focus when things fall uh, feel out of control can be tricky. Can help and find focus when things are interested and enjoy. All right. So I will start with. Dr. Bob Brooks, show them how it's done, boss. This is your third thing you get to put in. <laughs> well, I, you know what I would uh, put in, as you know, for me, resilience is based on the, our connectedness with others and personal relationships. So in my backpack, I would probably have photos of some of the most important people in my life uh, that I could look at. Now, of course, it would be on my iPhone. Uh, <laughs> I think it's very important because all the research shows it's almost impossible to be resilient if you don't have strong connections, even with one or two other people. So th they would they would be my security blanket, knowing that there are these people around. Well, there was another uh, a psychologist, uh, Chuck D, who said it takes a nation of millions. So I think that, you know, I think that's really true. We should keep it in the backpack. All right, Alexandra, Sean, what goes in our backpack? My first thing would definitely be a CBD tincture, versatile, can use anywhere, emergency moment. <laughs> um, and my metaphorical thing would probably be like a loving kindness meditation. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would put, uh, I'd put empathy in my backpack, I think. Something that a lot of, you know, especially if I'm imagining I'm putting on my backpack and as we're talking about going in and re-emerging into the world, uh, yeah, I'd put all the empathy that I can sort of, you know, carry around and, you know, allow that to sort of color my interpersonal reactions for sure. Can I just reinforce again what Sean said, if it's okay? Every yep. one of my resilience books has a chapter on empathy. Mm -hmm. It is it is almost impossible to have close relationships meaningful without being able to put ourselves inside the shoes of someone else. And that's why I often say, what words do you hope other people would use to describe you? But what do you intentionally say or do on a regular basis so they're likely to use these words? And that helps mm -hmm. us, you know, just simple ex empathy exercises to really think about how our actions impact on others and also how we understand others. So I'll reinforce. And when you said, uh, you know, even meditation, I didn't mention that before, but I've started. One thing I've changed is in the past, I didn't do this every uh, every afternoon for just 10 minutes. I uh, really meditate. I exercise in the morning, meditate just briefly. And those are things within our control that we can do. I just wanted to reinforce it. Well, I like it. So some extra reinforcement on the great choices we've already had. You know, my uh, grandmother 
I bless her. I wish she could have ever seen the show because I just thought of something that she would add to the backpack.